Motorsport 411 presents all the four and two wheeled action. Motorsport 411 with Sean Cartavillas. Welcome to Motorsport 411, your home for all your four and two wheel action in Africa. Coming up, we have a special with a true rally legend as we feature four-time Safari Rally winner and former general manager of the Safari Rally, Mike Doughty. All the four and two-wheeled action. Motorsport 411. Welcome to the show. Now, he was born in 1936 and is best known as a navigator for Shekemeta. Mike Doughty won the Safari Rally four times and later became the general manager for the event. I recently went to his residence and had a chat with him. Mike, uh, thank you so much for speaking to us on Motorsport 411. Uh, first of all, how did you get into motorsport? Right in the beginning, in the, around about 63, 64, I bought myself a, a Renault Rojo. Uh, and of course, uh, I knew I was the best driver in the world. So I uh, grabbed my ma and, and said, come and do a, a, a local rally in, in uh, Eldoret or Kitali, where I lived in Eldoret at the time. And so my very first rally was me driving my Renault Rojo with my ma navigating. Uh, we came fifth or sixth or something, but um, I immediately discovered that I was not the best driver in the world and my brother-in-law, my sister's husband, uh, had a very rich mother and he had a Saab, um, one of those incredible two-strokes that Eric Carlson was driving. So we did several rallies, half a dozen rallies in that, all in, in Western Kenya. I, I, I was hooked on it. It was incredible fun. Then in 66, Richard Barber, who was a farmer in Kitali, said, come and do the safari. Of course. Um, so we, we bought a, a, a VW 1200 and we did the safari in 66. We did incredibly well. I think, think we came seventh. And it, it was fantastic fun. In fact, when we were packing up the, the house to come here, I found a report that I'd written just after that safari. And the enthusiasm of this young man is, is fantastic. The majority of entrants didn't make it. Out of 88 starters, only nine completed the course. But Ford's won the manufacturer's prize. Now, from the unsinkable seven or the magnificent seven, uh, those were the finishers in the 1963 and 1968 rallies, uh, featuring the likes of Nick Nowicki, uh, Peter Hughes, and Jaginder Singh. How did it feel uh, competing in those days? It was it was incredible fun. Uh, with Richard Barber, I did uh, 66, 67. 68, 69, we did in Renault 16s, and 70, we did in a Peugeot 504. Which, um, I lived in Kampala at that time, and we rolled it uh, about 20 kilometers from my house straight into a swamp. <laughs> um, no, no, that, that, was a, that was a Renault we rolled into the swamp. Uh, the, the Peugeot... We, we crashed the day before the rally when some damn journalist came along and said, let's go and take photographs. And we stuffed it straight into a bank. But uh, General Motors, who had entered the car for us, uh, were very good and they took one off the, out of the showroom and put the suspension on it. And so we did it in that car. But at the end of that, uh, it was a very, very, very exhausting safari. Uh, and Richard, at the end of it, said, you're sacked. We're not driving any together anymore. <laughs> you said you didn't think you were the best driver. How did you get into navigating? Well, when I, having discovered in my first rally that I wasn't the best driver in the world, uh, 
I was very keen on the sort of mathematics and science of all this navigating. Uh, and so fell into it straight away, it was no problem. And I actually became fairly good at it. Now, Mike, uh, the 70s is really when international drivers started competing. How did the Safari Rally change? We were, in, 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 I was incredibly lucky mm. because I lived in Uganda at the time uh, and Shaker was just starting rallying. And so when Richard Barber sacked me, Shaker was right there, ready, let's go rallying together. Mm. And Shaker, even though he was incredibly rich and could afford to buy his cars, he was also a very good salesman and sold himself to people like Nissan. Uh, and we started driving for them. And that, 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 you, you can't imagine anything better than driving for a works team, particularly Nissan at that time, who were the best in the world. Uh, Wakabayashi, the team manager, oh, what a fantastic man he was. Um, he would sort of sit you down in the workshop and say, now, Mike, son, what are we going to do? Yes, I think that's a good idea. That's done. Shake us and what do we do now? And we had sort of long discussions about how things worked. Um, and, and it always worked with worker. For example, in the 81, 80 safari, mm. when we were all having um, back axle problems, we arrived at Kisumu uh, service point and without any information or argument, well, back wheels were off the ground and they changed the back axle in 13 minutes. Fantastic. Now, synergy between navigator and driver, that's very, very important, obviously. Uh, tell us about your chemistry with Shekhar Mehta. Um, I, th I think we were very good friends. Um, we used to play tennis and squash and uh, drive rally cars and, 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 and play together a lot. Uh, so we were just very good friends. And um, Shaker was incredibly clever. Uh, he, he, he works things out all the time and, and makes a, 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 a reasoned decision about what to do in this situation. And it was invariably the right one. So it was, it was fun working with him, or I suppose you could say, really, we were playing together because we loved the, loved the, the game of, of rallying and we must beat those people. Yeah, that incredible streak with Shekha into the late 70s. 79, 80, 81, 82. Uh, in the four years before 79 we had either crashed or the engine had blown up or something terrible had gone wrong and so in 79 we said let's go for it Let, when, when, we, when we die let's be winning and so it just kept going and going and going and so we won it uh, everybody said we were incredibly lucky. I, I think we were very lucky. So we had to prove it in 80. Uh, that one worked just as well. 81 was, 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 was a, a very funny year. Um, when we got up towards near, near Baringo, the roads were incredibly flooded and we fell off the end of a bridge. So we, we had to lift it back onto the road again. Uh, so we lost quite a lot of time there. And then, uh, but Rauno had got through with no problem. Then uh, up near Archer's Post, they, they produced a, a, a route change 
And they said we have to go straight from Archer's Post straight down to Isiolo. And Rauno had a problem on that uh, and he lost 10, 15 minutes. Uh, when we met uh, Wakabayashi at Isiolo, he said, okay, Shaker, you win. Rauno, you come second. Hold position. So we motored all the way down that horrid me uh, Meru to Embu bit, which was incredible fun and uh, very slippery and great fun. And then uh, at one stage, just the other side of Embu, on the way up to Karatina, Shaker said, there's somebody coming. So I said, oh, it's probably Jack Simonian. And Shaker Mehta going for his third consecutive win in this safari rally in Kenya. And being chased now by the guy who was perennially second, Ronaway Alton and the other flying fin. And so we let it pass. And as it went past, we said, that's not right, Jack, it's Rauno. Oh. So as, uh, we, we said, go, 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 go for it. So we had a, a hell of a battle for quite a long time. And Shekameta has taken the leap. He's be, he will be being chased now very hard by Ranaway Alton in car number five. I know we rammed each other. I don't know whether it was Rano into my door or Shaker into Lofty's draw. Uh, but we, we got to uh, Neri, where we met Wakabayashi again, and he waved his finger at us, you naughty people, you must follow instructions. I said, Rashaka will win, Rauno will come second. Anyway, we got back to Nairobi and we won by, I think, three minutes. It was close, very close. Close, yeah. yeah. Uh, and then Rauno produced a bombshell. He said the distance in the road book that they'd given us from um, Archer's Post to East Yellow was wrong. So our answer was, but we, we had both wrecked this. I gave you my notes. My notes say that the distance was 29 kilometers. They say it's 23 kilometers. It, it doesn't matter. Mm. But Rauner was so cross that he protested. Uh, the protest was thrown out. So he appealed to the FIA um, Shaker had to go over to Paris to, to fight it with a lawyer. Uh, anyway, that got thrown out as well. So we won that. But uh, unfortunately, we never spoke to Rano again. And uh, he never was offered an, another drive with Nissan. Uh, but that, 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 that was sad, but... Uh, Unbelievable. You mean to say you've never spoken to Rauno up to today? I, I oh, have never today. seen Rauno since then. Wow, amazing. 82, you won four in a row. I remember eight, 82, we came one, two, three. So we came up the, the main road from the airport, all three abreast. It was a fantastic feeling. Now, after 82, uh, did you think that four in a row was enough with Sheka? What happened next? Uh, after we won in eight, 82, I was offered the job of, of manager, general manager of the Safari Rally. So we're speaking with four-time Safari Rally winner and former general manager of the event, Mike Doughty. We'll be back. All the four and two-wheeled action. Motorsport 411. Welcome back to the show. So we're speaking exclusively with four-time Safari Rally winner and former general manager of the event, Mike Doughty. Mike, uh, how was the transition from navigator to manager? Uh, I, I, I think a, a week after the safari, uh, Barrett Bardvard said to me, will you like the job? I know I was incredibly frightened of the job. Um, because I knew that the whole world would be watching and everybody was waiting for me to make a cock up. Uh, I knew that would happen. So what I, I used to go to work at four o'clock in the morning so that I could do the day's work 
before people would come in and I could sit there with my feet on the table as if I had no worries in the world. Uh, and then uh, I'd go home at 10 o'clock at night. So I was doing a, a full day's work, but I could also sit and chat to all the, all, everybody who came in as if it was just a Sunday holiday. Uh, where was the Safari Rally office based in those days? When I very first started running it, uh, when they were at Westlands, um, but within a very short time, maybe a year, we moved to um, Hurlingham. Yeah. And I, uh, I had a lovely office there, and it was, it was very convenient, easy to get to, and so on. Interesting. Now, how was the AA, the Automobile Association, associated with the safari in those days? Uh, AA had originally uh, organized it all. And in order to be able to get sponsorship and so on, they created Safari Rally Limited, a separate company, wholly owned by AA, but a separate company, with its own directors and managing directors and so on, so that we could ne negotiate with potential sponsors. We, when the safari had started off, I think the, the East African Standard were the main sponsor, and then Omega came along, and then uh, Barrett Bardwaj did this deal with uh, Marlborough, yes. which was a lovely, lovely, uh, sponsorship deal they were lovely people to deal with now mike it looked like the job was a 365 day affair how difficult was the rally in those days compared <sighs> to today's rallies having done the safari a lot of times i knew very very large amount of of, of, of kenya and where roads went and so on the only roads that I actually found were the one over from Narok up to Caricho. I wonder what it was called. But that was that was through a forest. And in Reiki it was a disaster. Um, I, I kept on getting stuck and Bob Kahn, who was my assistant at that time, uh, his famous words, oh, no, not again. That's five times today. <laughs> uh, and also I found the route like, round the Loiter Hills. Mm. But e everything else were old, old roads used by from forever. The Marlborough Safari is one long, natural, unrelenting, unforgiving, unforgettable open road achievement of the impossible and has become as much a part of the East African nation's heritage as its wildlife, its mountains, its jungles, its rift valleys. Archaeologists consider Kenya among the most ancient lands on Earth. Rally drivers deem it among the most challenging. Mike, what was the experience of driving for a works team in those days? When we started working for Nissan, it, it was easy because we had plenty of recce cars, so we we used to drive the the whole route at least three times and and the the difficult bits which we were knew go, going to be in the dark we'd probably do four or five times um as private entries up until um say 66 to 70 uh, we used to manage one recce uh, pace notes hadn't been invented then. With Shaker, we invented our own pace note system, uh, which we refined over the years, uh, and that was incredibly efficient. Um, in, in fact, the, the last couple of safaris, we only had to do it three times because the pace notes were so good. Um, the difficulty about the safari was getting tired yeah. uh, because uh, unless you were right at the front, you were having to motor for 24 hours, have three hours sleep, and then motor for another 24 hours. Mm -hmm. Now, in the latter part, 
we were always very lucky in that we uh, would only mo motor for 18 hours and then have 10 hours sleep. Uh, as the poor buggers at the back were in and out of, of, after the rest hold. So, but exhaustion was, was a major, major problem. When you get tired, your, your decision process is so slow and um, it, it's sort of rather like alcohol. It interferes with the brain. Very interesting. Now, which driver or navigator do you remember most fondly? Um, well, all, the, all the, the, the top Europeans, the Swedes, the Finns, uh, Hanu, Hanu Mikkele, Bjorn Voldegard, Rano, uh, Andrew Cowan. They, they were all super people and they were totally professional and, and, and fun to be with. Uh, and it was sort of rather nice being a, a local yobbo from, from Kenya, being able to chat to people like Hanu Mikula as if he knew me. Locally, who do you remember most? Vic Preston died recently. Uh, how do you remember him? I did a couple of three rallies, I think, with Junior. And he was a, a very competent driver, but he had a terrible problem that he didn't, didn't speak left and right. If you wanted him to go right, you would have to say right, left. And if you were busy holding your, your pace notes because they shake and you've got to have thumbs to keep your place, you can't say right, you have to say turn right. Now, Junior had a very bad problem in that you'd sort of say uh, easy left into, into turn fast right. I said fast right! <laughs> and that was very trying. Uh, I did one rally with Juginda and he was not into pace notes at all. Uh, I, d I did the recce, this was in the Ivory Coast, and I did the, the recce with a local uh, and wrote all my pace notes. And the, in, in the Ivory Coast, there was several sections where you were going over brows, over brows, over brows. And one or two of them, you would over brow left hand, over brow right. And I, I made sure that I got all these things right. And I would say to, to, to Joe, okay, overbrow, caution, medium right, okay? Uh, 300. Max brow, max brow, max brow. And he would change down a gear. Uh, so that was all unsatisfactory. Um, but he, he just hadn't grown up with pace notes. Shaker and I, we grew up developing a system of pace notes yeah. and we knew they were right. Jaginder would, if, if you'd said to him, Max Brow, he would look at it and say, well, I, do, I think that's going to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So uh, purely, purely training. Incredible. Now, how was Jaginder Singh as a person? He was a difficult character. Uh, he used to uh, treat his navigator like the, like the Spanner Boy. Uh, but he was all right. He was a good driver, competent driver, a bad sportsman. In the Ivory Coast Rally, uh, we were soundly hammered by Andrew Cowan. And Jaginda was very rude about Andrew Cowan. He's an, an old man. He shouldn't be able to drive properly. <laughs> <laughs> Mike, how was Vic Preston Jr. as a person? He was, he was fun to to ha hang out with. Uh, his only only fault was his lack of, of left and right. Uh, but he was a very competent driver, very good indeed. Uh, and so long as you could keep him going fast on the right road uh, without having to wave your hands at him, he was very, very, very good. Yeah, Mike, uh, tell us about Shekhameta. Oh, he was a lovely fellow. Um, had a, 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 a 
a very well-developed sense of humor, was fluent in a vast number of languages, and it was very interesting. If he had been speaking, if we were in Uganda, and he was been speaking in whatever language it was to an Indian, for about the next 30 seconds, his English would sound like an Indian speaking English. And when we were in, uh, in the Ivory Coast, he spoke fluent French. And when we were chatting to the, the, the uh, people over there, uh, Shaker could speak to them properly in French all the time and, and make proper decisions. And for 30 seconds after that, he would speak English with a French accent. And he was an incredibly clever fellow, great fun to be with. Um, we used to play squash and, and snooker and tennis. That's about it. Yeah, how big was the safari in those days? I remember from the very, very earliest ones, um, we, we lived in Eldoret and uh, uh, Gordon Gobi was our hero. He drove a, a Rover P5 in the Magnificent Seven Year. Uh, so us kids would, uh, Mr. Gobi, can we have your signature, please? So this is going way, way back. And right up until I started competing, uh, like, like the whole of Kenya, we used to close down and watch the safari. Uh, and then, of course, when I started competing, uh, you realize that the whole of Kenya was watching it because every village you went through, people were excited and, and, and uh, enthusiastic. Except in uh, Moranga and places like that where used to, they used to throw stones at us. Now, whether they threw stones at us was because they disapproved or because they knew we were a moving target and wouldn't stop. Who knows? Um, but we, we had to stop using Moranga area just for that reason. Local media coverage reached the very few Kenyans who did not actually witness part of the event. For five days, the press will report little else. Now, as general manager, Mike, how important was your job and how big was his staff? Well. In, in fact, we had a very small staff. Uh, in the office, there were five of us, that's all. Uh, but we'd, we split the country up so that we would have the Rift Valley province and the Nanuki province and the Coast province. And we would set up and have a chairman in charge of this area. They would organize all, all the control officers and all everything like that so uh, and they were all volunteers um, and and they did an incredible job I remember when I very first took over the chairman at Nanuki said uh, I want Barrett Bardvaj back I'm not going to I won't be available okay I say so I get uh, Jill Llewellyn in to do the job. And he was very angry because it worked well. So he then came back and said, I'm ready to come back again. I said, no, I'm sorry. We've got a very competent chairman now. <laughs> but uh, the, the, the assistance you got from all over the place, uh, we used to plan the control officers briefing so that everybody could have a party um, and, and a little serious bit took about an hour and then a party went on for six hours. <laughs> Tell us about the classic safari rally and how you were involved in it. Yeah, it was Mike Kirkland's idea and, and he conscripted me and uh, Surinder Tati and we, we organised the first one. Uh, it was very hard work and very successful uh, and um, we, we, we ran a second one and Mike Kirkland said 
I don't want to do this. This is much too much hard work. Let's sell the, the, the business. Uh, now, Mike had been very, very clever because he'd registered the name East African Safari Rally, which nobody had ever copyrighted. Mm -hmm. So we owned that name, wow. which was very clever of Mike to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so we had a sellable property. Um, I, I only had one or two shares, so it, it bought me a, a first-class seat and an aeroplane to wherever I went. <laughs> Now, Mike, do you still consider yourself a local motorsport hero? Um, no, I, I, I gave up so long ago that very few people will remember me. Yeah. Uh, so that's it. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Mike Doughty, what a man, a local motorsport hero. You know that word is thrown around like confetti. He really is a true legend. Meta and co-driver Mike Doughty had suffered an incredible array of mechanical problems, yet persevered. An axle lasts a normal car a lifetime. The winning car went through seven in four days. Seven axles, seven lifetimes. Mike Doughty, the four-time Safari Rally winner and former general manager of the Safari Rally, is speaking to us in an exclusive on Motorsport 411. We'll be back. Motorsports 411 with Sean Cardavillis. So that's it for the show this week. Uh, once again, a very, very special thanks to Mike Doughty. As always, our thanks go to Big City Studio. I'm Sean Cardavillis. 